reading a book several years back. I was comparing a Caucasian meditation center with a Thai temple. And the woman who was doing the study was talking to one of the Caucasians one time. And she said at the Thai temple they weren't doing much meditation. It seemed a shame that they weren't really practicing. And the woman in the center had the good sense to say, wait a minute, there's more to the practice than just meditating. She said, go back and look more carefully. And sure enough, the people were practicing generosity, they were practicing virtue. They're teaching their children gratitude. As you begin, the woman who was doing the study began to realize that there's more to the practice than just sitting here with your eyes closed. We're developing all kinds of qualities of the mind. And so you can look at your whole life as an opportunity to practice. It doesn't mean you just be mindful all the time or alert or aware all the time, but there are qualities you've got to develop. And one of the lists that's useful to think about is the list of the perfections, the bottomies. This doesn't come in the suttas, it comes actually as a result of gathering together all the tales that were connected with the Buddha's previous lives. And they're trying to see what are the qualities that the Buddha developed on his path. And they sorted out the tales by the different qualities, and they discovered they had ten. But all the qualities come down to basically four, which are the qualities of related to determination. When you make up your mind you want to do something, you want to attain a goal. And then the qualities of mind that you have to develop as you think about the goal you want to attain and how you're going to attain it, then actually go, go about doing it. The first quality is discernment. You have to figure out what's a really wise goal to have, what would be a worthwhile way of dedicating your life. Because you do have the choice. You can dedicate your life to a particular goal. You can just say, well, I'm just going to go with the flow of whatever comes to me. But the flow tends to go down. Very rarely it goes up. I mean, there is evidence of rivers going up mountains, but it's under a lot, under a lot of pressure under ice caps. Everywhere else, water goes down. If just like, let your life go in what the Thais call yatakam. In other words, whatever your past karma pushes you, you just go in that direction. It usually doesn't go in a good direction. So you've got to make up your mind, I want something out of this life. I want something to show for the fact that I've been alive and been through a lot of suffering, but I've got something to show for it all. And the Buddha offers us the best goal, the, the end of suffering. But there's a choice you have to make. How much you're going to focus on that goal? What other goals you're going to have in the meantime? Once you've chosen your goal, though, you have to figure out what's the best way to get it. So you want to find happiness. Well, you have to make sure that your quest for happiness doesn't cause any misery to other people because they're going to get in the way. Make sure it doesn't harm other people. Now, there may be people unhappy with the fact that you're taking this path, and that doesn't count as harming them. But if you're actually harming other people in your path, which basically is getting them to do things that are against the precepts, then your happiness is not going to last. So you have to find a happiness that doesn't oppress other people and doesn't harm anybody else. And the way that you go about it has to be something that doesn't harm many people either. This is why when the Buddha is talking about discernment of goodwill, excuse me, when he talks about discernment, goodwill comes in as part of it. There's a passage where he says, if someone has ill will, do they have right view? And the answer, of course, is no. Because right view is all about finding a happiness that's harmless. So in that sense, right view and right resolve go together. We can't really separate them. Once you've made up your mind on your goal and how you're going to get it, then you just be true to what you've figured out. 
Now that's, in other words, it's going to ask more of you than you might want to give. But you have to make up your mind. Is this what you're going to really stick with, or are you just going to drop it and go back and let your old karma just push you around? You see this particularly in, in the precepts. You make up your mind, you're going to stick with a particular precept, you're going to abandon a particular activity, and you've got to be careful to watch that you do that. There's nobody out there, there are no policemen enforcing the precepts. You've got to have your own inner policeman to force these things. That requires mindfulness, that requires alertness, all of which are good qualities to develop in preparation for the meditation. So you stick with a goal, even when it gets tough. Because you realize if you can't trust your own vows, if you can't trust your own determinations, what can you trust inside yourself? And if you can't trust anything inside yourself, who else can you trust outside? As the Buddha said, if you're not a person of integrity, you're not going to recognize integrity outside either. So you've got to develop this quality of integrity inside. And that leads to the next of the three qualities, which is generosity, which also entails renunciation. There are going to be things you have to give up. It's not the case that once someone decides on the path of awakening, everybody in the universe is going to cheer them on. Even in Buddhist societies, and a lot of people who want to go for awakening get a lot of pullback from their parents, their families, the society around them. But you have to remember, as John Fuang used to say, there's nobody here who's hired us to practice. We're here of our own free will. We're nobody's servant. This is one of the true ways in which you can show that you really are independent, that you're going to follow this path. But you have to realize that there'll be a lot of things you have to give up. There are lots of ways that you could advance materially, say by breaking the precepts. And if you have to hold by the precepts, there are times when you have to do without. Well, you have to decide which is more valuable, the, the gain you would get from breaking the precepts or the fact that you've got this precept that you're holding on to. Renunciation is basically a trade. It's not that you're just giving up everything and you're left with nothing. You're giving up things of lesser value and for things of greater value. You're trading candy for gold. The problem is that sometimes it doesn't look like gold yet. You've got just a promissory note. You don't have the gold yet, but you look at the candy and you realize if you eat the candy, you're never going to get the gold. So in order to deal with situations like that, you need a fourth quality, which is calm. You're going to be able to keep your mind calm and equanimous and patient in the midst of the difficulties of the path, the difficulties of sticking to the path in a world that's not behaving in line with the path. We're trying to develop these perfections in an imperfect world. Neil Karras seems to be getting more and more imperfect all the time. But you can't let the tendencies of the world determine how you're going to live your life. After all, it's, it is your life. And it's your decision what you want out of this life. So make that decision while well, use a lot of discernment in choosing your goals. And then remember the other three qualities that go along with that truth, renunciation, and calm. The calm is there to give you the strength you need in order to stick with the difficult things. So you can arrive at a deeper calm when you achieve that goal. All too often you hear that the Buddhist teaching is about not having goals at all, but that has nothing to do with what he taught. I don't know where that teaching came from. Maybe from retreats where they're afraid that people will get too pressured to show something for the retreat. But we're here on a lifelong path, and the path has got to have a goal. 
to choose your goal. Well, be truthful in sticking with it. And be calm about giving up the things that get in the way of the goal, the things that you're going to have to sacrifice in order to find something of deeper value. That's what it means to practice in daily life. In other words, you rearrange your life so that it's in line with your goal. You're not just sticking the practice into little corners of the, or the cracks of your life. It's better to think of living daily life in the context of the practice rather than practicing in the context of daily life. Make the practice your overarching context. Always keep that in mind. That puts everything else in perspective. <laughs>